Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eileen Strumpel, and it is my honor and pleasure to serve as the inaugural dean here at the Herb Albert School of Music. Welcome to Los Angeles on this gorgeous sunny day, and it is my thrilled pleasure beyond joy um, to welcome you today to this final closing uh, afternoon here. Our conversation of the last of this past year has extended on this just waiting series. Um, the series actually came about in gestation after the murder of George Floyd, just a little over a year ago. And um, at that time, we as a school community really decided collectively that one of the things we really needed to do was create a safe space for having challenging conversations to learn from each other, to be able to uh, deal and process with some of the, the pain, the anguish, the confusing emotions of the time. Um, and most importantly, to think collectively about who we as a school, as a society, as individuals, how can we be a better version of ourselves? How can we, how do we not just um, accept the moment, but work to change the moment? How do we build momentum on that movement? And this whole year of conversations has been such a blessing. It has been beautifully curated by my dear friend and associate dean, Arturo O'Farrell. Um, he is actually on his way back here to Los Angeles uh, for tomorrow's uh, doctoral ceremonies and um, in his stead, we, I, it's my joy and pleasure to welcome the chair of our Global Jazz Program, Steve Loza, to host this afternoon's conversation. Um, and can I just say that I have, I'm a little starstruck by our guest today. I've never actually met anyone that has their own postage stamp. Um, and uh, what can I say, um, having such a, a bright, searing intellectual light, um, full of heart, full of musicality, grace, intelligence, discernment, and sensitivity to come and join us for conversation this afternoon is beyond thrilling. So without any further ado, I welcome you and pass you along to my dear friends, and I thank you, Dean Strempel, for that introduction. <clears throat> and we have a very exciting uh, guest speaker today as part of our um, Anti-Racism Action Committee. Uh, and I am, as the Dean has mentioned, I'm here in place of uh, Professor Arturo O'Farrell, who is on a plane right now coming back to UCLA for our event tomorrow for our graduate students. But it's my honor to be here. Uh, we are welcoming here today, and I am the co-host today, uh, also with Professor Hitomi Oba, whom I'll be introducing in just a minute. But Ayodele Cassell is an incredibly important artist, a contemporary artist, who, as the Dean mentioned, is also uh, contributing to our academic, our philosophical uh, conversation about the issues of race, of social justice, of intercultural conflict, and how we as artists must be so concerned about those issues. Uh, Ayodele Cassell uh, in 2017, in 2017, was invited to do a work at the Spoleto Festival USA in Charleston, South Carolina. And just at about a little before that, she had done a major fundraiser where she presented her work while I have the floor for a Hillary Clinton event. She has said that in terms of her artistic life uh, without compromise is the most incredible freedom that she can express through her work. Uh, Ayodele was born in the Bronx. She was raised in Puerto Rico. She studied at New York University where she actually studied acting, but it was there that she was first exposed to the art of tap dance. She became one of the featured soloists and only woman in the Savian Glover's uh, Not Your Ordinary Tappers uh, Dance Company. And she also was featured on Broadway in the musical Bring In The Noise, Bring In The Funk. In 2005, she created her own work, A Diary of a Tap Dancer where she evolves uh, in performance her own story while also honoring historic female tap dancers, especially black women. In 2006, she was on the cover of Dance Spirit and she co-starred in 
Imagine Tap in Chicago in the same year. She also toured with LA Dance Magic. She co-created the online resource operation TAP, and she co-founded Original Tap House, a performance and rehearsal space for artists in the Bronx. She sees her art form as a power, quote, to speak to social injustice, race, identity, and politics. In 2018 to 19, she was artist in residence at Harvard. And in 2000, uh, 19 and 20, she was a hello, a fellow at Harvard's Radcliffe Institute. Uh, it was there where she began a project based on her um, previously mentioned diary of a tap dancer, colon, the women, where she looks at this important group of black women. And one of her messages is that there are so many women who have been unrecognized in the field of dance especially this, these Black women to whom she paid tribute to in that particular work. In 2018, uh, she created the uh, concept of decolonizing dance, which was hosted by Gibney in New York City. And again, concerning the women Black dancers not receiving adequate uh, opportunities in performance and academia. Uh, in other words, she was wondering the question, what is it that presenters find appealing or not appealing in terms of how they program dance troops or dance performers? In 2019, she was featured in Joyce's tap filled fall schedule, and this included a full length show with our, with our own Arturo Ferrell and his Afro Latin uh, jazz orchestra. Uh, in the words of Arturo Ferrell, quote, she is a listener, a contributor, and a true partner. The two also uh, performed together in Adelante Cuba, a celebration of Afro-Cuban and Latinx music and dance at New York City Center, where she also choreographed a revival of the musical, Really Rosie. She was also the featured artist of the inaugural City Center on the Move program last year, which included her lecture demonstrations in each of New York City's five boroughs. As of this coming July 14th, she is presenting a series of weekly tap performances to New York City Center live at home, uh, which is an online service. Finally, she directs the graduate program of what is called uh, a, a, broad, a Broader Way Foundation, where she teaches leadership skills through the arts to young women ages 19 from 17, who attend New York City charter schools. The New York Times bestowed on her in 2019, breakout star of 2019. Uh, Luke Hickey, one of her dance collaborators has said, quote, Iodela brings the legacy of her heroes into every space she occupies. She is fearless, but also welcoming to everyone. She invites us into her process. So, Finally, I want to mention again, uh, I saw her performance of While I Have the Floor, an incredible performance that I watched online, uh, and I recommend it to anybody who can watch that. She makes a statement there that really caught my fancy. It said, any great type of art, especially dance, is like a great form of literature. She's trying to spread that idea of how the arts are so often not looked at that way. Um, incredible dancer and incredible narration that she does in that show. Uh, finally, just to add, uh, <clears throat> Ayodele Cassell has performed in venues ranging from the subways of New York to the White House. At this point, I'd like to introduce Professor Hitomi Oba, who would like to say a few words in introducing our guest lecture. Uh, Hitomi. Thank you so much for this introduction, Chair Loza. Um, as Dean Strempel and Chair Loza said, it's such an honor to have Ayla De La Cassell um, join us today, really with her extensive career in the arts and in dance and um, all while interweaving woven with uh, social justice issues. And just, I think, one of the fearless leaders of our time. It's really such an honor. Um, Ayla Della did um, express that she would like to have 
for this form to be of a discussion. So if while you're watching, if you have questions for her, please feel free to drop questions into the Q&A and we'll try to interweave them into our conversation with her. Um, so before that, though, she does have a presentation. So without further ado, um, we'd like to invite and welcome Ayodele Cassell. Hi, y'all. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction, Hitomi and Steve. I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I felt I feel like Steve, he gave my entire lecture was just done. So it's over. OK, goodbye. No, I'm kidding. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank um, Susan and Arturo and all of you for the for the invitation. I feel like it's always such um, I, don't know, I just feel a lot of gratitude whenever people invite um, you to share your experience. And so I just want to say uh, start by just expressing my gratitude for your time. You know, um, I'm, I feel so lucky. I feel so lucky to have been able um, to travel the world, to meet uh, all kinds of people, to um, really live my life fully um, as, a, as, a, as a tap dancer. Like that is what I do. I'm, and, and if you had told me when I was nine years old um, that I was going to live in this way and that I was going to, you know, learn as much as I have and and really um and really truly learn so much about myself through tap dancing I would have said what that is insane um I came um to tap dancing very late I was 19 years old uh when I started uh studying um I want to share that I am from the Bronx I was born in the Bronx um and I was raised in Puerto Rico I am black and Puerto Rican my father is black uh, my mom is Puerto Rican. Um, I, at the age of nine, I moved to PR to live with my grandparents. And I remember feeling very, um, uh, I didn't know the, the language at all. I couldn't speak Spanish. I just kind of was there. And I remember um, just feeling really isolated and really lonely and, and, and not being able to express myself. And I remember my grandmother teaching me how to speak the language and um, by, with, the, with the letter stencil. And she would say like, ah, be, se, che. And I had to relearn how to speak. And, you know, we're kids, we kind of, you know, we learn language pretty quickly. Um, and so I became really fluent, you know, within like a year. I was supposed to be there for one year. I ended up staying for six. Um, and so in that time, um, I had obviously the opportunity to absorb the culture, what it, you know, and which is much different than New York City. I was like, you know, running around with chickens and I had, um, you know, just nature all around me and our school projects were about like you know identifying the the leaves and 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 all of the creatures around us you know um and so but in that time my english sort of got out of practice and so then at the age of 15 i moved back to new york city where my um i feel the same sense of hesitancy of not being able to like talk and not being able to express myself and i felt um i didn't want to go through that again and so i tell the story about my struggle with language because um it was in my senior year in high school where my english teacher who i think was really tired of, of teaching english decided that she would she wanted to uh you know to just teach something that she wanted that she wanted to uh you know um, give to us. And it was, she made up a course called history of the movies. And so I was 17 years old. Um, and I'm watching for the very first time, Fred and Ginger, right? Ingrid Bergman. But when I saw Fred and Ginger, I was like, Oh my God, like, I just couldn't believe that, that they could like, they just kind of like, just move so gracefully, you know, back and forth. And I was like, how do I do that? And so I, I became like, kind of obsessed with them, like super obsessed with Ginger Rogers. Like all I wanted to do was like, look exactly like her, which of course that was not going to happen. But I was like, I want to learn how to do that. So I would go home and I would like rent their movies in the library. And I would like, kind of like, you know, just teach myself how to do what they were doing. I. I was not doing any of that, but in my mind, I was like, I'm Ginger Rogers today, you know? Um, but I remember um, really wanting to be, take part in that culture, but I also saw that um, she was blonde and white and I was black and Puerto Rican and from the Bronx. And I was like, that's never gonna happen. There's no space for me there, but I still, I was still dreaming. And then um, I knew I wanted to be an actor. I went to NYU uh, Tisch and um, my sophomore year, they offered tap. They offered Tai Chi and tap. And I was like, wait a minute, that is what I've been wanting to do. So I got myself some tap shoes that I saw at like Payless Shoe Source because they look like Ginger Rogers shoes. And I put some taps on them and I kind of like went into this, into this class, but I became like really, really obsessed. And 
what I realized was that um, this thing with language, unbeknownst to me, my, my struggle, my need to communicate, my need to express would find itself in tap dancing. And shortly after my, my you know, foray into flat, ball change, flat, he heel, spank heel, toe heel, that like sort of remedial thing that I was loving because I was like, I'm living my Hollywood life. Um, I met this, uh, a, a peer, he was a freshman, his name was Bakari Wilder, and he taught me about um, what tap dancing really was. And so in my first session with him, where I thought I was going to really do something with my flat heels, I heard him going, like with his feet and I was like wait a minute that is crazy that is like not anything that I've been doing and so he saw in me like shock and he says he was like wait a minute do you know he was like do you know the Nicholas brothers do you know Gregory Hines do you know Savion Glover do you know Sammy Davis and I was like no I had like I just had no reference for them and he was like no no he's like you know tap dancing is expression tap dancing is communication he goes tap dancing yeah it's not just a flap and it's not just a heel and, and that he's like it's it really comes from yourself and he's like and it's really rooted in this country when he said that um and and um I realized that um a couple things one I realized that this art form that I was really drawn to for some reason was actually really rooted in the need to communicate. And so for me, the idea of my struggle in Puerto Rico as a nine-year-old and then my struggle in New York again at 15, that I could find a, a way to express my feelings and my thoughts through rhythm, it clicked. And I like did everything I could to try to like, to learn how to continue to express myself in that way um and it became another language so the same thing learning how to improvise became like my words steps became my words and i was like with my with my feet and i was like this is like the best thing ever right um and then i also learned that this art form that i was drawn to was really rooted in my own ancestry that i did not have to be ginger rogers right but that actually tap dancing was born in this country and that it was born out of the uh, experience of black people in this country and um that anchored me not only to the art form but it gave me a sense of pride i was like this is me right Gregory Hines is me, Sammy Davis Jr. is me, John Bubbles is me, Bill Robinson is me. You know, that tap dancing grew up synonymously in this country with jazz music, right? That means that Art Tatum is me, right? That Duke Ellington is me, that, you know, that, that Ella Fitzgerald, you know, in her interpretation that that is me and that that is this, this form, you know? Um, and, and, and it just like, just kind of like set me off on into this like obsession. And I talk about um, very often in my work and, and not only in my work, but even when, I, when I'm when i invited, um, much like today, I always spend the time speaking about the origins of the form because I think that it is really important to understand that tap dance, the roots of tap dancing. Um, and I think that historically people tend to kind of categorize it in this thing. They're like, oh, tap dancing, it's like that fun thing that people do with their arms. And it's like the fun number in the, in the show. And it's like, that is what how it has been used but that is not what the form is. And so when people, I think, understand what the form is and what it grew out of, then there's a different weight and depth and um, uh, an appreciation that I think that goes into it. And so I tell the story um, and I don't know who's, you know, who's watching and, and, and if you know, but I'll say it here again, you know, tap dancing was born in this country when black people were brought here, African people were brought here and enslaved. And they, and they brought with them their drums and their power and their rhythm and their spirituality and their language and their culture and their relationships and, and their rhythm and how they could communicate so clearly through, you know, through their rhythm and how they would start revolts across plantations just through rhythm. And that, that when that's found out, laws are enacted, slave codes are enacted in order to take, remove those drums and to strip African people, black people here of everything that they have left. And what I love about tap dancing, what I love about um, the spirit is that you cannot squash that. You cannot suppress um, what is meant to be expressed. And out of that lack of being able to do this comes right and it's like you have to do that and so for me i think that um i don't know i i, I find a lot of pride in knowing that what a hu that the human spirit and the spirit their spirit 
um, had to find another way to express and to communicate. And um, I don't know, I just, that that I think is, is really important. And it's important sometimes when I teach because I feel like sometimes people think that it's about the that expression, the just like the superficial thing. And I feel like once they understand like, no, there's something in you that has something to say, like you're here because there is something that you want to say and you want to communicate and find that, right? And then stay anchored and rooted to that and go forth, you know? Um, I was lucky enough to uh, begin tap dancing with um, uh, in a company called Not Your Ordinary Tappers, as uh, Steve mentioned earlier, with Savion Glover, who was, and I was lucky enough to come up at a time when in 1990, the mid nineties, I believe, where tap dancing, there was a resurgence and there was an, uh, uh, a focus on young people. And so we were um, like, you know, traveling the world as tap dancers. I feel like um, I got a chance to um, I don't know, just really represent the form um, in a way that was maybe uh, authentic to its roots. Um, and then there was a lot of focus on young folks. And I noticed two things. One was that audiences were wowed by what the footwork was. And then I also noticed that every time people saw me as a woman, they'd go like, oh my gosh, you girl, you tap dance? I didn't know you tap dance. Look at women, I didn't even know women tap danced. Or they'd say, I, you know, you can do everything they can do. I mean, and they would seem like so like wowed and impressed. And I was like, wait a minute, like I know enough, I'm young in this, but I know enough to know that I'm not the only one. And so that prompted me to find out who were the women that were maybe out there with Bill Robinson and, uh, you know, and John Bubbles and the Nicholas brothers, because I knew that there's no way that in like 1997, that was the first time that they saw women tap dancing. I knew about Ginger Rogers and I knew about Ruby Keeler and Eleanor Powell. I knew about all the white women. And I thought, well, if they existed, where are the women that look like me, right? Where are the women whose, whose hair does this and <laughs> whose skin color is not, <laughs> you know, white. And I found um, um, Jenny Lagan and, and, you know, Lois Bright. And I kept, and, and I just became really obsessed with finding out who else was out there. Um, and this is before like the internet in that way. You know, I had to like, do, everything was like via phone call, calling a paper, getting the number to a writer, trying to find this, you know, those kinds of clues. Um, but I found that they were out there and that because of racism and that because of sexism, they were not given the opportunity to, um, to really um, just share who they were or to even live the dream in the way that I, was allowed to do in that moment and i remember feeling very guilty about that i thought oh like it's it, i think it's um i feel bad that i'm you know that i'm able to sort of enjoy this tour or that i'm able to enjoy like you know interviews or whatever and they did not have that opportunity so but then i realized i can't change the past and because i can't change the past what i can do is that i can bring them into every experience that i have so that you know when people look at me they also recognize and acknowledge who those particular women were. Um, and so I believe that they have been very influential in how I have done my work um, because I think it's important to just to acknowledge, you know, who, who was laying the groundwork before us, you know? Um, and so one of the other things I was going to say that I noticed about people's distance, I said, I think that what I can do there to sort of close that gap is to really start to present uh, start to use all of my aspects of my of my expression so that people understand not just through my dance but that they understand through my storytelling um, and through uh, my words um, what this art form means to me and that it's not just about you know doing steps and that it's not just for the sake of entertainment but that it is something that I really you know um, I don't know that that I felt like if the audiences could see themselves and who the artists were, that their connection to tap dancing would deepen so that the tap dancing was a bonus so that they understood my fears, my dreams, my hopes, my joys, my uh, pain, um, and those of other tap artists and what makes them do what they do, that it would uh, create a thread um, that would be much more uh, meaningful than just a performance where you can say, you know, or not, or walk away. Um, so 
Um, I will say that I, one of the things that I think so much about, um, and I'm just going to kind of keep, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping around because I, I want to be able to say all the things and also I want to be able to show you all something. But um, I, I wanted to, my, my, my train of thought just left. Um, but I don't know. I, I think what I would like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go into show this, to show this particular clip. I was going to say that I felt like for many, many years, um, no, I was concerned that people wouldn't be interested in the story, that they wouldn't be interested in the history, they wouldn't be interested in my story. And so I kind of had all of these ideas that were just like sitting on a shelf somewhere. Um, and then finally in 2000, um, 2016, I was invited to write something and to write uh, and perform at New York City Center as part of a concert. And I took the time to write what I called While I Have the Floor. And I'm just gonna share it here. It's a seven minute version. Um, and in it, I, wa I wanted to share what my influences were and also what my fears were because I was really concerned that, um, that my story would end up like so many of the forgotten uh, women of tap dance. Um, so I, without any further ado, I will share this. Okay. And speaking of someone who knows about being a woman in a man's world, she's given up the glass slipper for the tap shoes and is going to break the glass ceiling from the floor up. I give you Iodeli Cassell. Shuffle, heel, toe, a cramp roll, a paddling roll, and over the top. They're just steps and words. Alone, they don't really have a lot of meaning, but when I have something to say musically and rhythmically, they're, to me, as profound as any great piece of literature. Tap dancing is genius. I think it's like magic. That you have two pieces of metal on each foot and an infinite amount of music. A groove, a flow, no hesitation. When I dance, I feel like um, Ray Barreto on the congas. I feel like I'm Orestes Blaton Timbales. I feel like I'm Tito Cuenta Timbales. I feel like I'm Hector Lavoe when he sings his soul. It's also where I get to be all of me. A black and Puerto Rican woman fully connected to both cultures. I wanted to tap because of watching Fred and Ginger in high school. Black and white photos of movie stars lined the wall in my Bronx bedroom. After school, I'd pop Roberta in the VCR for my daily dose of Hollywood glamour. I'd teach myself how to tap along with Fred and Ginger. My brother would come in to the room and say, you are crazy. And I didn't really care what he said because I loved it and it made me happy. And I'd go for lap, heel for lap, heel for lap, heel, heel. For lap, heel for lap, heel for lap, heel, heel. Again, again, again. Eventually, I got to the point where I could really, really do this.
Pero una mujer no podía hacer esto. We weren't allowed to do this. Hollywood thought that being a chorus girl was more our speed, and they thought that we lacked the strength to perform flashy steps or the presence to hold an audience. Not true. Because I discovered Jenny Lagarde, the first African-American woman to dance with Bill Robinson, grown woman. Yeah, I know, Shirley Temple. But she was a child and white. And the brilliant Lois Bright, who danced with the Miller Brothers but wasn't billed with her last name. Just the Miller Brothers and Lois. And Juanita Pitts and Corla Red and Louise Madison and Marion Coles and Alice Whitman. Women who donned everything from hot shorts, skirts, suit, tie, and Oxford taps. Women determined to be taken as seriously as men and refusing to compromise their skill set based on dress. They didn't have a hoofers club, an invitation to dance with the men. I did. I was invited to dance at Funk University, the training ground for bringing the noise, bringing the funk. I penetrated the boys club. Those long forgotten women were just like me, hanging around stage doors, learning new steps, showing up to dance in the face of bigotry, sexism, and lack of opportunity. So I'm going to say their names as often as I can because I have the floor. Jenny Lagon, Lois Bright, Louise Madison, Cora Lared, Juanita Pitts, Alice Whitman. I am afraid sometimes that I will also get lost in that shuffle. Will some young kid discover that I existed, that I was here and that I danced? So until then, shuffle, heel, Toe, cramp roll, maxi forward, flap over the top. Two pieces of metal on each foot and an infinite amount of music. A groove, a flow, no hesitation. Yay. Um, I wanted to say something about, just as I was listening to that, I remember when I, uh, when I performed it for the first time and in the section when I say, and Shirley Temple, she was a child and white. I remember um, having to say it, not, being know, not knowing how it was going to be received because I didn't want to appear as though I was saying that Shirley Temple's life didn't matter or anything like that. But I just wanted to be really clear about um, there's a difference between uh, a black woman holding space on screen in the 1930s and a young white child. Um, and I have found that um, in my speaking of, about history and uh, of tap, tap dance's history, uh, that, you know, um, you know, some things get uncomfortable because tap dancing is, you know, we have to talk about slavery. We have to talk about racism. We have to talk about, you know, um, Jim Crow. We have to talk about uh, the silencing of a people. We have to talk about cultural appropriation. We have to talk, you know, through, through you know, when we talk about the history of minstrelsy in this country, we have to talk about um, the difference between Irish indentured servants and what it means to be like um, a slave. Those are like, Two different things, um, and I have found that um, I each and every time that I have an opportunity to speak on it, I become bold, bolder and bolder because my pursuit is in the truth, and my pursuit is an acknowledgement and, my, and honoring um, of these lives, right? And so there's no for me, I don't think that there's any room to sugarcoat those things. We have to talk about the reason I did not know in 1997, 1998, and I didn't discover till like 2000, and that was through a lot of digging that I did not know about Jenny Lagan was because of the specific erasure um, of those women. Um, and, and not only because they were women, but because they were black women. And so for me, it's really important to name that. And um, I don't have a, a current injury about it. Like, you know, when I, when I first wrote that 2016 piece, I felt very afraid. I had a lot of fear that, um, that my own life, that I could live a whole life as you know who I, as me, <laughs> and that people wouldn't know 
anything about me once I once I left this earth. And I felt like that um, was unfair. It was unfair for me to miss out on the um, knowing who they were, possibly maybe even getting to spend time with them, much like I spent time with Gregory Hines, who was my dear mentor, right? And so um, for me, it's, it's really important to name that so that we do not repeat that. Um, and I don't, um, I have become more and more uh, confident and it's become like a thing. So it's like, you know that if you're gonna to talk to Ayodele about it, you're gonna hear about this. Um, and as I said, I do it in pursuit of balance, in pursuit of truth and in pursuit of um, honoring, you know, my, my own ancestors and my ancestry. Uh, I think that, I don't know that that is um, just really, really an important uh, thing to do for me. Um, as I as I walk through this world with some privilege um, as an artist, you know, um, I think that I don't know. I, I feel like I, tap dancing lives really squarely in the center of those things, um, and I remember even like. For myself, uh, I think Steve mentioned in, in his introduction that I attended a panel called Decolonizing Dance. And so the issue for me was that I kind of, as I said, I grew up in the 90s where tap dancing was like really like at kind of again in its heyday after it had been sort of had a lull in the 60s and 70s and it started to pick up steam in the 90s. And then there was a lull again and nobody was really interested in it. And then there was an advent of like dance TV shows. So you think you could dance, Dancing with the Stars, this world of dance, all of these things. And tap dancing was like nowhere to be found. Um, and then when it was there, um, it was being, being represented mostly by white, um, white artists and, um, um, and, and some of whom were like my very dear friends. And to me, I just felt like when I started to see, see that those, in those concert stages, I wasn't seeing people of color. I was not seeing black people who were equally des deserving of the opportunity, who had been carrying this torch and this legacy and this history with them in their bodies in a really high, sophisticated level, just in the same way not getting the opportunities. I said, you know, there's a problem with that. You know, um, and I knew, I felt like maybe I'm risking my own sort of, you know, career by sort of p pointing out these truths, but it must be said because then we end up right back where we started, right? Um, and so I, I said in that moment, I said, you know, this is a black art form. It doesn't mean that everybody can participate. Everybody can participate. It's the most beautiful things about it is that it's an international form at this point, you know, but we have to honor those roots. We have to honor the contributions of black people. We have to honor the current black artists who are, um, who are, you know, keeping the torch alive, who are creating wonderful work and they need support. They need, you know, and this is not right. And it just so happened that um, in the audience was uh, the new director of programming at the Joyce Theater. And it caught his attention and he called me and he was like what do you want to do um and you know i had mentioned i had just started to do work with arturo um at uh at you know at um city center and he made the invitation and i said and we said okay we're gonna do a show together and ever since then we've just been like woohoo like it has snowballed so i um i say all that to say maybe this is a good point to bring in um a good time to bring in he told me or steve um but i was gonna say that it was through that speaking through speaking my mind through saying the things that might seem uncomfortable through those that that everyone um has responded really favorably and that they have opened the door to hear um, to hear these truths and to, you know, and to be educated and to also have a different and more deep and a deep appreciate appreciation of this form that I love so much. So I don't know, that is like my initial thing. And I would love to, I don't know, hear what you, I don't know, what does that bring up for y'all? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing that. I definitely got goosebumps listening mm -hmm. to your presentation, just your I think pursuit of truth, you said, and just balancing things out, your courage to be able to do that and your conviction is really inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, because I think we're many of us who are wanting to take action with these things are, you know, sometimes it's mm -hmm. difficult, we have our careers, we have our positions to think about and just, um, yeah, you moving forward with this with such conviction is extremely inspiring. Um, I had, I, you're, you're talking about just like the contexts 
and the communication of these things that surround your art form. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is applicable to a lot of the art forms of the people who are here on this um, in this webinar today. Mm -hmm. um, like, in particular, you discussed it right now, and you also presented it in the work that you just presented for us. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I think in your most recent installment of the Diary of the Tap Dancer, you know, it was all about like artists talk about what is the context, what are you meaning to express your emotions, your feelings, speaking your mind um, surrounding your art form. So it's not just, you know, the audience isn't just getting the end result of the products that we're producing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I would love to hear more about that, your, you know, idea behind that project and all these things you do, which you've already touched on, um, and how that might apply to a lot of people are here, especially a lot of the younger students, um, mm -hmm. as we're going forward, because this keeps coming up with my students a lot, like what what is the purpose you know what are we trying to communicate especially as people um, yeah. within the society Whether... yeah oh please yeah. yeah i can yeah i can i can respond to that i think you know what i what i have learned through i've been now this is this year i think marks my 26th year of dancing professionally and you know and, um uh but i was gonna say that what one thing that that tap dancing teaches you almost immediately because it's so improvis you know improvisational in nature is how to really hone your own authenticity like who are you what do you have to say what are the things that you lean to how does your body move what do you hear musically how do you express that you know what kind of steps do you use to to articulate those things like you if you are going to learn anything about the about yourself through the form is you have to learn who you are right and so what i and so you even though it was a journey i had to learn how to accept myself like literally accept where I am in the journey, who I am. Um, uh, and it's very one of the reasons why I very often lead with, my name is Ayodele. Ayodele means joy has arrived. It's Yoruba name um, and it's, it's Nigerian. It is, I, you know, I am black, I'm Puerto Rican. I grew up in Puerto Rico because all of those things um, inform how I do what I do. And I cannot change any of those things, right? So instead of, and I, and I, and I use, I think about those, those, uh, things about my identity as my superpower. And so I feel like nobody can take my superpower away. So I try to enter all of these spaces knowing those things, right? I can't be anybody else. I can't be Ginger Rogers. And I, you know what? I don't want to be Ginger Rogers, <laughs> you know? Um, and so um, I think that, I, I don't know. I find that like, once you have a good grasp on like who you are and what's important to you and what, um, uh, I don't know what your values are. Like I always say, like you know, what I want for myself, I want for I want for everyone. So I want freedom of my own. Exp I want freedom of my own expression, the freedom to be who I am, the freedom to wear what I wear, dance how I dance, speak how I speak, wear my hair like this or not. Like whatever whatever those things mean to you, um, and 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 to lead with that in every space that I enter. And so for me, it has become. Um, easier each and every time that I get to, uh, I don't know, that I enter a space and I get to speak on those things. Does that, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but I don't know, I just feel like you're, and it's, it sounds really cheesy to say like, oh, just be yourself, be yourself, it's important. But the truth is, is that that is actually like, can be a lifetime journey <laughs> for many, many people. Um, and, and a lot of people spend their time trying to be someone else um, and not honoring who they are, right? And I think, um, I don't know. I, I want my life to matter. Like I, that's something that I just like really have been able to articulate in the last even year is like, I want my life to matter. And I think one of the thing, one of the reasons that I'm so adamant about speaking about those women um, or, or this history is because their lives mattered too, right? Like their, the way they chose to live their life, the way they, uh, their pursuit of mastery of their art form, in spite of extraordinary difficult, racist circumstances <laughs> the fact that they the fact that the nicholas brothers achieved that excellence you know in spite of that gregory in spite of that sammy davis jr in spite of like that that is something i don't know we have to i use that as like a blueprint i'm like if they can do it then i have to do it and their lives mattered and i deserve i i my life also matters <laughs> the way i live it matters you know what i mean yeah Steve, yes, go ahead. I see you. <laughs> I see you raising your hand. Go ahead. Before I ask my question, uh, we want to remind everybody out there that if you have a question, you can. There's a Q and A section in case mm -hmm. you have. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did. You know, I was very. I daily when when you. I was very inspired because I can relate to it so much, that, mm -hmm. you know, 
sometimes you finally just have to say it, mm. uh, not counting all the times that you sort of covered your mouth, you know, mm -hmm. because of the political ramifications, because of, like you said, oh, you're, you're pouring water on my project, but, <laughs> um, but if you don't do that, you know, how can you really live mm -hmm. with yourself? Yeah. Uh, look at yourself in the mirror, you know, uh, and you know, what that also means is that if you disagree with me, then tell me also. In other words, we, we've got also here the whether it's a far right or the far left or the middle or between the middle and the far left or all those grades right. of, of, of those shades of gray. Uh -huh. um, you know, if we don't express ourselves, we're suppressing ourselves. Uh -huh. And I've come to the conclusion that's not, that's not healthy. So I appreciate what you're saying, because it is a risk. But mm -hmm. if you're not going to risk it, not only what are you going to have to say, what kind of art are you going to make? Yeah. So uh, the one question I would have is that I have often felt uh, beat, like at a certain point when it's just so mm. devastating or just seems like such a mountain to climb that mm -hmm. you're beating, you very often feel like giving up, you know, uh, moving moving to another country i don't know mm -hmm. you know you feel like that doesn't mean you're right. going to do it, but right. you feel like giving up the battle have you ever felt that and what do you do about it oh my gosh Are you kidding me i felt like that like six six months ago <laughs> <laughs> six months ago i felt that you know i mean <laughs> i know we're coming you know we were <laughs> he said this morning <laughs> <laughs> I was, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's especially, I'm sure everybody on this panel can relate, especially during this year, this last pandemic year, where every, especially for artists, where things were like, you know, everything was ripped from, you know, from under you, um, you know, it was very scary. I mean, I, thankfully, I, you know, I managed to walk away with my health. I'm very aware that that is not the case for many people, you know, over 600,000 people, exactly, you know, um, and so, I don't know it and, and then when you take into consideration the weight of that right and then also where how arts were being perceived or not being thought about at all and like they didn't think artists were essential, even though everybody was consuming art during this last year and a half. And then you think about the journey of an artist, um, you know, not everybody gets to like you know kind of like cash in the you know millions or be sustainable or whatever, and that can be really exhausting because it can be exhausting to just try to support yourself and then also it's extremely exhausting when. Um, when you are also um, feel like not only that you're trying to like advocate for something that where sometimes you feel like you're talking to the wall, you're speaking to the wall, you're not, you know, they're not hearing you. And so all of that can be very, very um, discouraging. Um, I certainly got to a point when I say six months ago, I mean, I kind of really was like really going down the rabbit hole. I was thinking this is like, not that I would ever stop dancing, but I was just thinking, you know, this is really hard like this. Like, I don't think that I want to do this in this way anymore. I just want to like garden and you know, I don't know, look at the birds. And meanwhile, knowing that that's not gonna pay my mortgage. So you have to like, <laughs> you know, you have to sort of like pull yourself out of that. Um, and I don't know how, how it happens, but for me, it happened with like an invitation, like connection. And somebody said, can you, what are you doing? Can you do that? Can you, will you share this? Will you, and, and you go, okay. And the next thing you know, you're like connecting again with people and then you're doing what you're doing and then all of a sudden you're like back you're back in it and so here i am speaking to you <laughs> after all i wanted to do six months ago was just like you know stare at the ceiling so yeah it does it does ha it does happen for sure um it was oh something else that you said before reminded me of audrey lord uh, you know audrey lord did that whole concept of like your silence will not protect you you know um so you might as well it'll eat you inside and you know you're not going to be any better for it so you might as well just ex express yourself and say the thing that's on your mind especially when it's in, in the pursuit of justice and the pursuit of truth and the pursuit of love and the pursuit of you know um balance and, and beauty speak <laughs> in the pursuit of freedom you know martin luther king also said something like that the, mm -hmm. those who are silent will eventually be who you who are really your enemies mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, Tommy, I feel like I, I, I sensed you were going to say something. Before. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, you know that that really made me think. I was thinking about um, so in 
a lot of anti-racism work, the involvement of community is so important. And you were talking about like the North connection with people bringing artists, like uplifting artists again. Um, mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you could share just like your thoughts on the importance of community in this, you know, work that's related to, but also outside of just the pure artistic practice, like, you know, the on the move, you know, five bureau tour, or just like mm. the involvement of people who are not in your field into our work to kind of sustain it. And also just for, yeah, social, social purposes. Yeah. You know, people, sometimes people ask me like where my favorite performance venue is. They're like, oh, where's, you know, where's, and I, to me, I'm like, I'm, I am happiest with anybody who wants to engage with me. And I said, that has happened at the six train in the, in the Bronx. It has happened in my living room with my cats back in the day. And it has happened at the White House and Carnegie Hall and Madison Square Garden and, 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 and. So to me, it's not really about the venue. It's about the people, right? And so, um, and I think it's, I think that uh, one of the things that I have really, uh, appreciated and I'm so grateful for as the world starts to open up again is that idea of like um not doing this thing anything in a, in a silo like that but really like you know being able to share like cuz I wanted to perform because I wanted to share the things that made me uh, made me feel joy and like one of the things that I I I feel like maybe subconsciously or very intentions intentionally one of the things that I really want people to to feel when they watch me dance is my own excitement for it like the thing because it really actually gets me gets my blood going it makes me you know it makes me happy I want I want people to to feel that as well um I I um one of the things that I did a few years ago um with New York City Center was called on the move actually Arturo joined me on that as well one of the things I love about him I just want to give have an Arturo appreciation moment is like Arturo he's game for like you know anything and I always there's something in me that's still always like a little hesitant to not hesitant to ask but I ask going well he's not going to want to do this and he's like yeah I'll be there let me know when so anyway so Arturo and I went on the move uh, through city center and we created like a 30 minute um sort of uh or 30 40 minute performance that was meant specifically to interact with community members of, of the five boroughs in New York City and these are communities that don't necessarily always get to go to theater that don't have sometimes the means to you know, spend $75, $100, $150 on a ticket to basically see us perform. And very often, I honestly sometimes feel like they don't feel welcome. No, sometimes these institutions are not reaching out to those communities to invite them in. And so one of the things that I loved about City Center was that they were saying, why don't we take our thing to them um, and they will learn about what we do, they'll learn about, and 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 it's like sort of a gateway into having another like a home at a, at an institution. So we went to these uh, um, uh, community centers in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and it was incredible. And there were people who were like two years old, and there were like ninety-two year olds who were like really kind of like in conversation and in communication with us. Like we had them like moving and singing, and um, and it was just, I mean, just fantastic. So that. I love, I also, um, I really, um, I, I've always been teaching, but um, I started to uh, work, well, it's like about seven years ago. I've been, I've been with the organization seven, eight years, a Broadway foundation, and I mentor young women um, from the Harlem, from Harlem and the Bronx, and, um, and, and some are from Brooklyn, but um, these are young women of color, they're uh, Black, Latina, Asian, um, and we, and and they're ages 10 through 17 in the time that we get to see them um, and beyond. And it was really important for me to spend time with them, um, with with people and young people that looked like me, that that was my, you know, that was me wanting to, you know, just have somebody to believe, you know, somebody to believe in me to see the little spark in my eye and go like, hey, you got this, you you know, go for it. And and so I, I think that um, that brings me a lot of joy too. That's another way that I connect on a, on a, you know, a daily basis with, with them in that way. Um, but community is everything. I mean, it really, really is. And I think we've all learned that as we have all been like, for the most part, like in our houses, you know. <laughs> uh, there is a question in the uh, Q and A. Mm -hmm. See it on the earth. Oh, yeah, I see it. I said, did you, I can read it. Did you have any female mentors coming up as an artist or were there even any at that time? How you're currently mentoring young women is so great. Thank you so much. Um, that is so interesting. When I think of mentors, the first people I think about are men because they were, the, especially when it came to the art form, um, they were, you know, 
primarily primarily men and it does it didn't mean that i i saw women um dancing like one of the first women i saw tap dancing um really with a lot of freedom was her name was is roxanne roxanne butterfly um and she i could not believe that she was like as fully expressed and like that she could be so so like I just remember thinking like she's making that up right now off the top of you know top of her head like I was so uh, I just was so like impressed with the sophistication of her expression she ended up becoming you know a really good friend of mine. Um, but in terms of mentors yeah most of them were men that were guiding me to be honest. Um, you know, and maybe that's one of the reasons why I like am being so intentional about uh, making connections with young people, because I think I you know I, I definitely. Maybe I, I wanted I wanted to be what I didn't have, you know, and so um, I don't know. I, I try to make myself as available as I possibly can to these young people, you know, because of that. As a, as a follow up, I think it's your your work with these kind of you know bringing more equity to gender roles within tap. I mean, mm -hmm. we're seeing this in a lot of other fields, like in field of like jazz, for instance, especially with instrumentalists, you know, mm -hmm. just these efforts to trying to make it more possible for women to thrive in the field have yeah. to do like exactly what you're doing, which is looking in the past and then also looking to the future mm -hmm. through the present, um, you know, honoring, bringing attention to the legacies and contributions, which you're doing, and then also mentorships like you were just talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And then. I mean, I think that has to do with intersectionality, right? Not just like intergenerational, but then you're also dealing with intersectionality with race and like, you know, working with women of color and, you know, highlighting women of color. Um, obviously, it seems like you think that that is one of the key points as you're talking, you know, having these dialogues about women in the field. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, do you have any other <laughs> things you could share with us? about, you know, even steps that we can take in other fields in this work well, trying to move forward. Yeah, you know, I one of the things that, and I'm hoping that this connects to what your your question, but it just reminded me of when Arturo first made this introduction for uh, invitation to come here. Um, he said, I really want you to speak about, and I haven't, haven't talked about it, I think, but I think it kind of like circles around what you're saying um, about, he's like about the fact that, you know, how you made a space, you know, um, as a woman. in a because when I, as I said before, in the nineties, when Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk was on Broadway and Savion Glover was like the talk of the town because of his genius and, and the, and the show that he created, I was so inspired by that. Like when I went to the public theater and I saw that show, I was like, oh my God, I'd never seen black people, young black people in a theater setting take up so much space and such an, with such authenticity and such power. And I just, I remember thinking like, that's what I wanna do. And not only that, I was like, and I wanna dance with him. Like he's the one I wanna dance with. Cause you know, he was like just amazing. And there was no, there were no women roles in that, in that thing. There were no women whatsoever. And, and to the person who, um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, who asked the question. Yeah, there were, um, I didn't see many, I didn't have any women mentors. And so um, it was really, I, I noticed it and it was, but it wasn't discouraging for some reason. I don't know if it's the Bronx in me. I don't know if it's the little black Puerto Rican spice or something or whatever, but I was like, oh, there's no space. Oh, I'm just going to make a space. <laughs> You're going to see me, <laughs> you know, um, and I would show up. I would just show up to every single thing. There, there would be a jam at New York Poets Cafe and I would go in there and they'd open the floor and I put on my shoes and it was mostly young guys in the circle with all their confidence. And my my female friends who were also studying would kind of hang back and they wouldn't go in and I'd be like, oh, no, no, you're not, you know, I'm ready for this. Like, you know, when I was a kid, they used to call me Muhammad Ali because I used to get fights with boys all the time so i was like <laughs> i'm good i'm gonna get in there and i'm i'm not i want i want to be heard i want to be heard i feel like i felt like i mattered too you know and so um i don't know i just kind of like i feel like my persistence and my uh my passion and my uh my really just super joy and obsession with it just kind of like made a space you know um it just it, it I made a space for myself and then I also I think knowing that it's so much better now like in, now in 2021 there are many more women who are who are out there who are dancing who are um being who are leaders in the field who are creating great work who are being seen who are being given awards and and and, and grants and and support of their work and it has and it has changed and I think it has changed because we were out there with you know like heart forward and with like uh with purpose right 
saying like, no, you, you will acknowledge me. And I don't care that you don't see many of me. I'm here, you know? <laughs> um, I don't know. I hope that that somehow, I, if you can like re, 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 state the question i hope that that's no, some absolutely around i think i think that's the best way i think that that's the best way you can think of it yeah absolutely yeah. thank you yeah and and i can i also say one thing that surrounds that and and that is that one of the things that i learned was the power of of your of really uh taking control of your story and your narrative and not having anybody not leaving your narrative for someone else to 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 tell you know and um I think what had, what I recognized happened with those women was that nobody was documenting them, and then they also, for <laughs> I'm sure, very overwhelming reasons, you know, just sort of like hung back and just you know disappeared. But it was because you know maybe they didn't feel empowered to really assert themselves in the same way that Miles Davis did or the, the Ellington, because we know their stories, you know. Um, and so I I said to myself, no, I'm not I'm not going to go. <laughs> I'm not going down like that, you know, and so I've really like been very intentional about um, making sure that I really express myself and that I'm fully expressed in all in all ways. Um, and that by telling my story, my story is connected to the stories that, that you don't know. So you're going to learn about them through me. And I think that that is another way that we sort of take back power um, is by um, really, uh, I don't know, giving weight to to who who we are, where we came from, what we love, and 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 moving forward with you know with that. Beautiful. You know, uh, speaking of making your own space, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very important that we here at UCLA, in our Herb Albert School of Music, make space for you to come mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. why, why should you just be going to Harvard? <laughs> You know, <laughs> to, uh, Northern Mexico, UCLA. Hey, uh, I'm happy. <laughs> and uh, we'd like you to come out here and uh, in the flesh, you know, so that, yeah. you know, when you were doing your piece uh, while I have the floor, uh, you know, your dancing is so, you have, yeah, you've learned all the traditions, but it's also so unique because you're, boy, I felt uh, everything from, from the Harlem Renaissance to uh, hmm. the Puerto Rican plena, Afro-Cuban rumba. Hey. <laughs> you know, I felt this blending is what you're talking about. Mm. Because our students, our, our people here, they're, they're white, they're black, they're brown, they're yellow, they're, they're mm. red. Mm -hmm. Of course, those are all artificial colors. Mm. But the more we work together in art uh, and the way we think, the other thing that you did in that piece was mm -hmm. you, you demonstrated how the artist performs and thinks. Mm. You know, this this thing about dividing performance from scholarship, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, music from uh, musicology. You know, you're you're blending that also. Dance is a form of music, mm. which you say in your piece because. Yeah. You're, the thousands of rhythms and the infinite music that mm -hmm. came. Yeah. The music. So, boy, wouldn't it be great if you could come here and yes, <laughs> even different types of music? Because I'm also wondering what kinds of music would you like to expand into? If we could mm. put together our Turo's group and Hitomi's group and and our and our symphony orchestra that we have here. Yeah. We could put those things. Yeah, together. I'd love it all. <laughs> dance is something that schools of musics often forget about. It's a mm -hmm. separate department of dance. So you bring to mind all of that, that uniting mm -hmm. those things is like uniting the people. Yeah. Uh, and uniting thought and performance. It's all the same thing. Performing is just as intellectual as, as uh, intellectualizing is making art. Yeah, I love that. And that's one of the things I love about Arturo, too, is like, there is no box. <laughs> Arturo is a king of that. Yeah, <laughs> there is a box. <laughs> and, and very often I go, I'm like, wherever you, wherever you take me, I'll go. You know, I just like, <laughs> you know, um, I love that. I, I don't know, like, where we are in time. And I feel like um, there is one thing, if I can, um, that I would like to share that is not speaking, but it's me and Arturo. Um, 
uh, at uh, with Chasing Magic. Uh, this we oh. we did this thing uh, that was you know th we we had set aside some time. The director was like, okay, he's gonna come in. You're all gonna do five minutes. Well, 16 minutes later, they were like, okay, <laughs> stop it. But um, but I wanted to um, j just speak to that. I love that idea of no box. We are a conglomerate, uh, like of all of our experiences and all of our identities and our, you know, our, um, I don't know. And so I just feel like it should be celebrated um, and, and you know, always like hard forward. Um, but I wanted to uh, just share really briefly um, Arturo and I, and then I think, um, you know, I'll take your lead on the rest of this. Um. So the first thing I do whenever I play or talk or do anything mm -hmm. is I just get off that safety net. Mm. And I just will go with whatever happens at that moment. I bet you do too. I think, uh, yeah, that's a great way to describe it because I actually say that I go wherever you take me and I feel like we do the same thing. Like We're, we're kind of doing this together. Though. And it, Yeah, yeah. And I think that I love that uh, the thing about like no plan. And I think that's what I'm talking about when I, when I think of like, like magical moments, it's like that complete faith and trust that whatever is going to be will be. Que sera, sera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Well, it's um, like being in the sandbox. When you get in the sandbox or the monkey bars or whatever, the jungle gym, whatever you're, whatever game you're playing with your friend, you don't sit there and go, well, you start on level three, I'll start on level nine, <laughs> and we'll make our way slowly to the middle. <laughs> right, right, right. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. You know? The sandbox is big, mm. and it's fun. It's that's like, my that's just, this is my sandbox. Hey. <laughs> I like your sandbox, but I don't know how to play on it. No, and, I mean, same here. Thing. I'll do the thing and <laughs> get that first moment. You want to play? Let's do it. Hey. Okay. All right. Let's do it. Go. I love you. I love you. I miss you. I miss you so much. Thank you. We really do. Thank you. I was thinking about the first time we played together. I was thinking about the Bronx. I was thinking about what was the Jerome L. Green performance space. Mm hmm. And but that and then with La Bruja. Oh, that was amazing. She, oh yeah, I, I quote her all the time. But like that first performance was like, it was like I felt like we had been playing together forever. We have. Mm. We have. Mm. For sure. Yeah. I'll follow you. Thank you. 
goes on for another seven minutes. Otherwise, I'll let it go. But um, it's just like, you know, I love the no box. You know, and I love the idea of bringing all of your, you know, everything you have available to you to an experience, you know, so. Infinite, <laughs> infinite music. Uh-huh. I, it's right. Um, I just see there's something in the chat from Neil. Uh, uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, about works for tap dancer and orchestra before the pandemic we were preparing. Yeah, you know, I know, um, I, Neil, I, I know that before there's this Morton Gould tap dance concerto that, that was written for a tap dancer, I think in the 80s, 70s, 80s, if I'm not mistaken. And then I actually did, worked with uh, Rob Capello um, uh, on, a, on a piece, uh, I think that we premiered, we wrote it for, for a symphony um, and, and an orchestra. Um, and we got a chance to like, I'm sorry? No, I, said, I said, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really fun. Um, and so, and I don't know, like it just, I did something with our tour just recently with the New York Philharmonic, like uh, in, in a community, we were in the Bronx and they, they asked me the same question. They said, well, have you, what have you done? Have you done? Are you interested? So I don't know, maybe it's going to happen again soon. Well, if, uh, <laughs> Neil, Neil asked the question. So we yeah, gotta, Neil. got to do it. Okay. Yes. Come on, Neil. I'm available. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh huh. Um, Neil, we're going to do it. Yes, yes. Let's make it happen. Uh, Got to make it happen. You, you can't just be stuck out there on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get me out there in the warmer weather, year-round warmer weather. I'd be right. happy. I'd be happy to be there. Um, thank you. Right. Make, some, make some music with the students. Yes. I would love that. Thank you and so much. It would be a way to bring all uh, mm -hmm. four minutes of the school together, you know. Uh, um, which is what we're trying to do. Hey, Tommy, I think that we're reaching the end of time, correct? <laughs> yeah, I believe so. This has been just so packed. <laughs> it's packed and inspiring. Beautiful. Um, uh, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. For I mean, presenting. for the opportunity. Um, I, I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. To, so I appreciate being here. Um, I hope that any of what I said sticks to someone in some positive way, <laughs> um, but that you carry the, the gospel of tap dancing and know that it's just a genius, well, genius form. So thank you for the invitation. I've, I've, I've got to introduce you to Kathy Nicholas. She's the granddaughter. Oh, I know Kathy. Oh, you know her, all right. Yes, I know I've known Kathy. Well, I mean, I haven't seen her in many, many years, but I do know Kathy, yes. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna hook her into it, but we gotta bring you out here. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. I, I personally, so I feel so inspired. And thank you for bringing all this with such joy as well. You know, we're talking about really difficult things um, that are applicable to a lot of us as musicians, I think, in this audience today. So thank you so much for thank joining you. us and sharing you, all, your, all of this. Thank you. And, you know, I will say July 10th, I believe, is the issue, first day of issue of our tap dance stamps. So, um, <laughs> so if you all are... Whoa. Whoa, Perfect. Yes, um, the art form of tap dancing is being honored, and there will be stamps, and I'm on one of them. And so, please send me on tour somewhere. Just put me in an envelope and send me to Australia or something. <laughs> that is amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, we hope to see you in person. In the I would future, love. Honestly. I would love that. Thank you, thank you. I don't know how it's how it's getting closed out, but I'm here. Thank you so much. Hasta la próxima. Hasta la próxima. Okay, bye.